Welcome to our weekly Sunday morning service here at Woodlawn Baptist Church. Titus chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Let's ask the Lord's blessing upon our time together. But Heavenly Father, we do thank you once again that we can gather before your word. And Lord, our prayer this morning is that you would open your word to us and our hearts to your word that you might drive the truth of this into us, or that we would recognize how great our need is for a Savior. Lord, we thank you that you are the Savior. We do pray now your blessing that this morning would bring great honor and glory to you and comfort to your saints. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Martin Lloyd-Jones, a great preacher in the middle of the last century in London, said this, he said, it is only when the church is seen as radically different from the world that she will attract others to her. In a similar vein, one of my seminary professors said this, the life of a Christian should create a longing in the heart of unbelievers, a sort of holy jealousy in that they want what we have. Writing to the church in Philippi, Paul said, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. So both scripture and the history of the church bear witness that a godly life is a powerful testimony to the transforming power of God. And to such a life we are called. In our passage, Paul calls Titus and the church in Crete and Christians in every generation to live a godly life. And he says that we are helped to do this by remembering just how great our salvation is. I'm reading from the New King James Version this morning, Titus 3, 1 through 8. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. When the kindness and the love of God our Saviour to our man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and those and these things I want to, you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. The call to be different from the world is absolutely essential in all generations. But what about to us today? The call to be different from the world radically different. Well, what does our world look like today? Well, let's take a look at these first two verses. Remind them, says Paul, to be subject to rulers and authorities. Is our world today subject to rulers and authority? Is it subject to any kind of authority whatsoever? And the question, the question it begs the obvious answer, doesn't it? No. There's no obedience to authority. How about uh, for every good work? 
Is our world today crammed full of good works? Not so much. Uh, to speak evil of no one, how about that? Is our world today full of kind and gentle voices? Or is the very opposite of the case? Is it humble? No. We live in a a, a society, in a culture, that is experiencing rapid moral decay on all fronts. And the call for the church in this day is to be radically different from that. Radically different. Not to speak evil, but to speak truth. Not to be prideful, which is all you see on social media, but to be humble. Not to be disobedient, but to be obedient to all authority, even when we don't like the authority. Paul, remember, was writing in the, during the Roman Empire. Do you think everybody liked Emperor Nero at that time? Not so much. But his call is for radical obedience to authority. How about speaking kindly to one another? Speaking evil. That's all the world does today. Speaking evil, whether it's politics or social discourse, TV news, it's just is full of evil. So we are called to be radically different. So in in verses three through eight in particular, Paul says you have to be different by remembering what you used to be like and what you would be like without Christ today. Remember that. Like an artist who wants to highlight a particular subject, um, they paint a, a dark background, and then that highlights the subject. And it's exactly what Paul is doing here. He's highlighting godliness against a background of absolute darkness. And he's speaking about us, about what we looked like before Christ and what we should never look like again. So he begins with the condition of the fallen nature. He says this, For we ourselves were also once foolish and disobedient. And then he goes on with that, that list of unmitigated horror in his day. The true fallen nature. Foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. This list was true of each one of us. Now, while it's true that not everyone is as bad as they can possibly be, there are degrees of evil. The potential exists in all unfallen people to be very evil indeed. And that's because the old nature is totally depraved. Every aspect is corrupted by sin. The mind, the heart, the emotions, and the will. There is no part of human nature that was not corrupted by the fall. In short, we became slaves of sin. And when you're a slave of sin, then any sin is possible. John Calvin said this, everyone is a slave to sin. Everyone has their wicked desires. All are not the same. They take different forms in different people. But everyone is a slave to sin. Now the unregenerate man balks at such a condemnation. Uh, I've been witnessing to an old um, business colleague for some years now. And when I bring up the, the fallen nature His response, and it's the response of all uh, unregenerate people, is no, no, we're not that bad. No one is that bad. There is good in everyone. And there is certainly a remnant of good. People are capable of doing good things. But the underlying nature is evil. Paul Washer, I don't know if you know Paul Washer, preacher, he was giving a talk on the corruption of the human nature. And someone got up who was quite offended by what he was saying, and he said, now look, Mr. Washer, 
We're not as bad as that. No one is as bad as that. And Paul Washer looked at him and said this. If every thought that you have ever thought could be displayed on that screen right now, you would run from this room screaming and you would never show your face in public again. And you know what? We know that to be true, don't we? If, all, if our innermost thoughts were revealed, even as we generally, we would be absolutely shameless. But as unregenerate people, the things that came into our hearts and minds, oh my goodness. And you know, one day it will be made public in the judgment. Every idle word, every evil thought, every wicked deed. All will be made known. But we don't hide them then. And when we think about that, we think about what we used to be. We fully understand and come to agree with Scripture that there's nothing good in us. As Paul said, I know that in me, in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Which is why we need Christ's righteousness. That's why, because we don't have any of our own. My New King James begins this ugly list with foolishness. For we ourselves were also once foolish. Now the Greek here has a sense of a lack of understanding. It doesn't refer to like simple foolishness, which we've all done. We've, we've gone out to the store, we've bought something uh, just because we liked it, and then we've got it home and we say, why don't we buy this? What a dumb thing to do. And we've done things like that and thousands of other things like that. This is not the kind of foolishness that he's talking about here. He's speaking of spiritual foolishness. This is the kind of foolishness that says there is no God. It's that kind of foolishness. This is the kind of foolishness that mocks the cross of Christ. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish. Foolishness that unto us were being saved it is the power of God. This is the reckless foolishness that causes a man to hurry along the broad way that leads to destruction. I was once on that way, and so were you, and maybe some of you still are. The next one is disobedience. We were also once foolish, disobedient. Disobedience to parents, to authority, to God's law. This was true of me and of you also. I disobeyed God every day. Do you see this in your own life? Can you look back on, the, on this list and see the next thing? Deception? Deceiving others or even being deceived? Being deceived by a false religion that you thought as long as you attended the church and did the good rules and, and tried to do this and went to confession and, and did penance that you were okay on your way to heaven? All the while living like a child of hell? Remember those days? Deceiving others, being deceived. Some are deceived by the promise of riches. Others by fame or beauty. Idols come in all shapes and sizes. John Galvin said, our hearts are idol factories, constantly churning out a variety of idolatries that drag us away from God. Idols may be recognized by the influence they have on our lives. They demand our time, our energy, our resources. They seek to capture the hearts and take away from God the devotion that is rightly His and His alone. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures. Everyone is a servant. Writing to the Romans, Paul said this in Romans chapter 6. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? That's pretty stark. There's no gray area there, you know. You're either disobedient, obeying yourself in this world, or you are obedient, obeying God imperfectly, like we all do. The, the trajectory of our heart is in that right direction. 
We serve God or we serve sin. The horrifying condition of the unsaved man is that they are slaves to unrighteousness. As unbelievers, those sinful desires dominated our lives. The Scottish preacher Maurice Roberts put it this way, listen to this. These evil desires begin to wrap themselves around our heart at an early age. At first they are like gossamer threads, but if not broken, they soon become cables of steel that are beyond the strength of any man to sever, and they bind us and make us slaves to every form of evil. Some were slaves to money, some to sexual immorality, some to gluttony, some to leisure, some to sloth, some to work, some to pride, some to fashion, some to sport, some to the praise of men. Some served one master, some another. But all were slaves of the enemy of their souls and were taken captive by him at his will. The Apostle John tells us that the whole world lies under the control of the evil one. That is an astonishing statement and it happens to be true. The whole world lies under the influence and the control of Satan. Except the children of God. Except the children of God. Is there a good reason to be radically different from the world? You bet. Paul says that Satan is a spirit that now works in the sons of disobedience, and such will we. And then there is malice. Serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy. Malice. What a terrible word that is. Who has not secretly despised another person? Who among us have not been envious? As a child, we were envious of another's toys. As a teenager, we were envious of another's popularity. As an adult, we were envious of another's accomplishments. Who has not had one time been angry or jealous with a sibling? Those of you who have brothers and sisters, you know that, right? Who has not been, who has not among us has muttered under our breath against a parent or a boss or a competitor? Have we never said a word against another person? Are we innocent of these charges? Have we never let a, a, a more, a, a, a little gospel, a, a gossip rather, a little gossip? little morsel of gossip slipped from our lips. Have you never done that? Who would be so brazen to say that they are free of any of these charges? We're all guilty of one thing or another. And if guilty of one, what does the Bible say? Guilty of all. You know, God's law like a sheet of glass. If I take a hammer and I just, I can, and I can hit that sheet of glass right in the middle and shatter it completely. And it's broken, right? Or I can take that hammer and knock off a tiny little chip on one corner, hardly noticeable. Is that pain of glass still whole? It is not. And that's how God's law functions. You don't have to hit it with a hammer. All you have to do is work around the edges. Guilty of one. Guilty of all. So in reminding you as our former estate, Paul makes it clear that our spiritual condition was so desperate, with such a list of charges against us, and with no defense to offer before the one who sees all and before whom we will give an account, we were helpless. We stood in the greatest need of a saviour, someone uncontaminated by sin who would come to our aid, pure and holy. Was there such a one? Yes. Is there one? Yes. The kind and loving God. Verse 4. But when the kindness and love of God our saviour toward man 
I love those thoughts in the scripture. You were lost in sin, thoughts. Now you are saved. And so forth. And the many of them. Pilgrim's Progress opens with these lines. As I slept, I dreamed a dream. And behold, a man clothed with rags, with a book in his hand, and a great burden on his back. He opened the book and he read and he wept and trembled, and not being able to contain himself, he broke out with a lamentable cry, saying, What shall I do to be saved? That cry has echoed through the ages. You see, when men see themselves in the light of God, when this kind of a passage strikes them and they see the truth about themselves, there's only one thing they can do. They can, and, and they have to cry out and say, what must I do to be saved? We know we must do something, but what must we do? Those who came under, the, under conviction after the preaching of John the Baptist asked, what shall we do? Those who were in Jerusalem and heard that Pentecostal sermon by Peter said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? When Christ appeared to Paul on his way to Damascus, Paul asked, What shall I do? When the Philippian jailer saw that all the prisoners were escaped, he ran before Paul and Silas and said, What shall I do to be saved? It is a question that is asked by all who will be saved. This verse is the pivot around which the rest of the passage revolves. For it answers the question, what shall I do to be saved, in a way that no man would ever imagine. What would man tell you to do? Do this, do that, work harder, pray more, give more. Do, 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 do. What does the Bible say? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. It's not by working hard or trying to be better. It's not anything that man can do to improve himself. It is simply by the kindness and love of God and our Savior appearing to man. And it appeared in the form of Jesus Christ, in the person of Jesus Christ, and in his atoning death for sinners. Romans 5, 6-11. For when we were still without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only that, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. It is in the person and work of Christ and Christ alone that this kindness and love of God is seen. Why would God, the Son, become a man and humble himself to the point of death at the hands of those he came to save? For my friends, although you and I did not actually drive the nails into the cross through his flesh, it was your sin and my sin that placed him there. The Dutch writer, Johann Hermann, captures the sense of it in his hymn. Listen to these words. Ah, holy Jesus, who was the guilty? Who brought this upon thee? Alas, my treason, Jesus, hath undone thee. T'was I, Lord Jesus, I was denied thee. I crucified thee. What a terrible but accurate confession. And how does God answer that confession? Well, not as we would expect in wrath, but God demonstrates his own love toward us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The answer to the question, what shall I do? Believe 
on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. In the Greek, kindness and love are expressed in a single verb. A verb describes action, so we know that God didn't just sit on the sidelines observing what we were doing. He took decisive action to come to our aid. And nor was this sort of a plan B that God had to invent because somehow, unnoticed by him, man had fallen into sin. Paul dismisses that kind of belief at the very beginning of his letter to Titus. Titus chapter 1 verses 1 and 2. Paul, the bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect, and the acknowledgement of the truth which accords with godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. This kind of teaching really puts God's actions on behalf of sinners in a more amazing light. And it's summed up by God's words to the prophet Jeremiah, Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and with loving kindness I have drawn you. Observe how this drawing is revealed. Verse 5. Not by works of righteousness, but according to his mercy he saved us. Not by works of righteousness. This is emphatic language. In describing the fallen nature, Paul has shown how impossible it is for such an unrighteous person to produce any kind of righteousness. If we are to be saved, it is by an alien righteousness, what Martin Luther called extra noose, something from outside ourselves that has to be applied to us. And that's what God does. He takes mercy on us in acting graciously to us. Now mercy and grace are inseparably linked. We might describe grace as God's characteristic of benevolence. And mercy as benevolence in action. As God reaches out and renders aid to those who are absolutely and desperately <coughs> And there are many examples of this in the Bible, but one of the most well-known, of course, is the parable of the Good Samaritan. He was a man who, the Good Samaritan saw, was walking down the road to Jericho, he saw a man injured, been attacked by thieves, stripped, and left, essentially left to die. He went out of his way, he brought aid, <coughs> carried the man into an inn, paid for him, gave the innkeeper some more money to take care of him. And if you spend more, I'll reimburse you when I get back. It's exactly what Jesus did for us. We were essentially lying at the side of the road, naked and bleeding and dying, and he came and gave help. Well, the priesthood, by the way, passed by on the other side lest they become contaminated by such a person. Whereas Jesus touched lepers and raised them up. He's merciful, compassionate, and gracious, willing to bear our, in our iniquities and heal our diseases. He saved us. How? Through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, who be poured out on us abundantly through our Savior Jesus Christ. When speaking to Nicodemus, Jesus spoke plainly about the order of salvation. And he said to Nicodemus, Unless a man is born again, he can't see the kingdom of God. It's not the other way around, by the way. And that's so important. Unregenerate men do not see the kingdom and say, oh, like that. I'll change my ways. I'll be a good boy. And I will live faithfully for the rest of my life. And, I'll, and God will see how good I've been and I'll, I'll get into heaven. It doesn't work that way at all. Because we're incapable. 
Unless a man is born again, he cannot see. That's what has to happen first. Before you see the kingdom of heaven, before you know you need salvation, you have to see it. In verse 3 it says, We were foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. That was our condition. We were lying spiritually. Impossible to see the kingdom of heaven. Something had to happen. New eyes had to be given. A new heart had to be given before we would see. And when that is done, and we are regenerate, then we can understand spiritual things. And only then, only then do we know that we need salvation. Now before a person is saved, he might catch a glimpse of salvation through what we call general revelation. That's the revelation that God has made available to everyone in nature. We see it, don't we? We see the magnificence of the heavens which declare the glory of God. We walk through a wood, a forest in the morning, in the freshness, and we hear the birds, we see the flowers, and we smell the sweetness of the air. And something whispers to us that this did not happen by chance. And then we stuff it down. We reject it. We suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Common grace may lead a person to feel blessed, perhaps by good health or by a loving family, by an act of kindness. Such things may even lead a man to religion and cause him to think about God. But until the grace of God breaks into his life, until he has given a new heart and a new transformed mind and sees with spiritual eyes, he will remain in darkness. And how deep that darkness is, my friend. Second Corinthians chapter 4, Paul writes this. If our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine upon them. For we do not preach ourselves but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your bondservants for Jesus' sake. For it is to God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. See, Satan commands this world. Satan is a spirit of disobedience that now works in the lives of the unbelievers. And you and I were like that, my friends. We were like that. And the darkness was dark indeed. But God gave light. God came into our hearts. Like the blind man who could not see until Jesus touched his eyes. So it is with all men. As Jesus said to Nicodemus, the Spirit moves where the Spirit will, and no man knows where he comes and where he goes. In other words, salvation is the sovereign act of God, and until the Spirit moves, no one can be saved. But praise God, the Spirit does move. And the Spirit has to. So as a recipient of God's grace and loving kindness, those who have been regenerated by His Spirit can sing, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Savior's blood? You know the one thing that all true believers say? Why me? Why me? Who can understand the greatness of God's loving kindness to us? How did Paul put it? Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his ways, and they are past finding out. All this is made possible through one person alone, and that is Jesus Christ. Without the atoning work of Jesus, the Holy Spirit would not be poured out upon us, could not be poured out upon us. Christ is a channel through which the Spirit comes upon us. 
He is the mediator. There is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. While God leads men to this salvation by many, many circumstances and many different roads, every one of those roads converges in one place, and that is Calvary's cross. Ultimately, there is just one way and one way only. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But, there's those beautiful words again. When a person <laughs> does come to Christ, they become heirs of eternal life. Verse 7. That having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We are counted as righteous and justified by the work of Christ for us. Paul's choice of words here is very critical. Having been justified. Now, technically in the Greek, this is called an aorist passive. It's something which has happened in the past to us. We were not active in it. It's passive. Something that acted on us in the past and has eternal consequences. Having been saved. In other words, once you are saved, you cannot be unsaved. Once the Holy Spirit of God has come into you and transformed your heart, he will never leave you nor forsake you. I, I, I don't really like that term, once saved, always saved, because there's a, lot of, there's a lot of garbage hanging on it. But at its fundamental base, it's true. Once the Holy Spirit of God has come into you and transformed you, and you know it, and we know it, and people know it, never leave you. So let's know that Paul ends with an exhortation in verse 8. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable. One of the reasons we are to be, 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 be constantly <coughs> evolved, involved in good works is so that we stand in radical difference to this fallen world. So that we stand as people that this fallen world want to know, yet they think we are weird. And some of them think we've lost our minds. But you live a life of godliness, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, empowered by the Holy Spirit, people will see. They cannot not see. It stands out like a sore thumb. So Paul has painted this dramatic picture. He used a very dark background to paint it so that we will see it, not be confused at all. Against this background of the unconverted life, he has displayed the kindness and the love of God in granting salvation. And the question you have, that I have today is, do you know this? Do you recognize that these things that Paul said were true of you? And do you recognize that they are no longer true of you? Because Jesus has come into your heart and has changed you and it is changing you, motivating you to a life of holiness and to grasp hold of eternal life. My friends, if you are a stranger to the grace of God, you may yet receive his blessing. The man who wrote this letter to Titus also wrote another one to Timothy. In 1 Timothy 1.15, Paul says this, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. You may feel like that. You may look at your life and you might say, I am the chief of sinners. There's no one worse than me. And if that's true of you, then look to the Savior. If the words are in your heart and mind, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Brothers and sisters, the Lord has poured out a blessing so great on his children that all eternity will be, will be insufficient 
for us to measure how great our salvation is. And so we are to rejoice in it. Because he did it, not we ourselves. And he calls us every day to remember that. To remember what we have been delivered from. And to live a godly life which is so radically different from this world. That it will not be failed to be noticed. And in God's grace, people might ask you, what must I do to be saved? And then you can tell them, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how powerful it is. It cuts through everything. It gets to the very core of what's important. Lord, we do thank you for so great a salvation. I thank you that there are many hearts in this, in this room today who are rejoicing in your great deliverance. But you, Lord, are the one who knows the heart. And you know if there's someone here today that is just pretending. Perhaps have been a member of a church for a long time. They've never really explored the depth of their own wickedness. Lord, if there be someone here today, you would please reveal yourself to them in such a way that it would be absolutely unmistakable that they are lost and that they need you and that you are ready to receive them. Lord, for those of us who do know Christ, we thank you and we bless you and we praise you in Christ's name. If you would like more information about anything you've heard today or inquire about online giving, you can reach us online at www.woodlawnri.org. God bless you, and we'll see you next time.